Electric Forest, how you doing? We've got Jesse and Luke Miller from Lotus. Give these guys a big round of applause. How about that set last night? I dragged you out here in the heat to talk about the excruciating tour life. So you're going to break it down, and all these aspiring artists in here, you're going to scare them away from ever going into music. Um, Luke, what, um, have you guys been on a long stretch, or is it, you know, it's summer, so you get to jump from festival to festival? Yeah, we did a big tour in the uh, winter, spring. Actually, I think it might have been our longest tour that we've ever done. That was done. your longest stretch? Um, we did, what, 46 shows? Yeah, I think it was like 46. <laughs> Seems like a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, now we're into festival season, which um, we kind of kicked off uh, by doing a um, trip to Japan and Hawaii, and then that kind of went right into Wakarusa. So um, uh, it wasn't shows every day, but it was you know a lot of traveling. But we got to see some gorgeous places in Japan, and especially Hawaii. And Where'd you hit in Japan? We played in Yokohama a Festival there, and then a club show in Yokohama, and then a club show in Shibuya, which is a part of Tokyo. What are what are fans of Lotus in Japan like? Are they diehard? Like we ne we need to hear the the classics. Are they ready to take a trip with you? What's what's the scene like over there? Yeah, we this was actually our sixth time to Japan. Um, I think the first time we went was 2005. Yeah, September 2005. So we actually have some fans that go way back that, you know, saw us many years ago there. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy because they, you know, they know the music almost as well as a lot of American fans. You know, they haven't seen as many shows, but they uh, keep up to date with what Lotus is doing. Yeah, and they get into it. And uh, there was people over there that, um, like, one woman had flown to the U.S. to see us play a New Year's Eve show all the way from Japan. And, wow. like, yeah, there, there's some hardcores over there. It's safe to say, then, that you are big in Japan. <laughs> Medium-sized. <laughs> or, or, or taller than most people there. So that You're extremely big in Japan in that way. Um, so with a giant, big, long flight to Japan, do you have to plan recovery days, or do you hit the stage from the tarmac? How does that work when, when you're doing something like that? Well, this is one lesson we learned from our first time when we went to Japan. Was uh, yeah, We flew straight in and went straight to the show. Um, and it, it wrecked us. Like the show went all night, and we were all just so. Yeah, now we build in usually a day because it's it's about a 11 hour difference. So you're pretty flipped. Sure. Well, also, a lot of the shows in Tokyo they usually either have them end early to so people can catch a train because almost everyone travels by train, or they just go all night so you can catch a train in the morning. <laughs> and that was actually the very first time we went to Tokyo. We played. We were in this underground club. It was like two stories underground. Played, you know, we had no sense of time because it's 13 hour time difference from the East Coast. And we played all night. I think it ended at like 7 in the morning. And we emerged from this basement. And it was like the most bright. I felt like a vampire. <laughs> we were just like, oh, turn it off. But then the thing was, the next show was the early show. So we had to go straight to that. Oh, my line. God. Did, did you know that you were going to be playing a seven, eight hour set when you landed up there? We knew nothing. We didn't, we didn't know anything. We just kind of. Oh, you know, we were obviously younger then, and we were just like, someone wants to hear us play in Japan? Fuck yeah, we're there. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. Uh, so, you know, obviously with air travel, you're going to catch some sort of bug from a screaming infant two seats in front of you, or, you know, just the exhaustion is going to wear you down. Is there a regimen? Is there a routine that you stick to to try and keep your health up? Yeah, I think everyone in Lotus definitely tries to stay healthy you know, it's surprising like you don't no one on our crew is really getting sick i don't think we've ever had to cancel any shows from people getting sick and maybe great part, maybe thank part, you so much maybe part of that is all the all the travel and exposure to other things but yeah worldwide know, germs <laughs> try to eat healthy it's, it's kind of crazy we coming into um into electric forest five of us had a layover in st louis and our Flight got canceled. We ended up having to drive all night. Oh my god! Um, Thursday night that was. But stopping at some of those gas stations just kind of reminded me of the old days of like touring a van, where you're like, you go through the whole thing. And you're like, okay, there is nothing I would choose to eat here. You're like, all right, now let's lower my standards, make one more pass. You're like, all right, bring them down one more. <laughs> how how long did that take? I mean, you guys were doing the five guys in a van driving through shitty towns, eating shitty food. How long did it take you to figure out, 
well, this is not sustainable. We can't, we can't do this. Um, well, I think we would have continued doing it <laughs> had we not been able to afford a tour bus, but um, sure. I feel like it was, it was just, um, I don't, I don't think anything was going to stop us. You know, we wanted to get out there and play music. Sure. At the time, it didn't seem that bad. I mean, now if we have to get back, you know, maybe we're spoiled now, but now getting back into a van is uh, seems a bit more excruciating than you see. But, you know, we used to, we were, started touring right out of college, and we'd be crashing on people's floors we didn't know. And just because, you know, that was, we weren't making any money on the shows. We were kind of just going gig to gig. And um, But, yeah, we were just going to do what it took. So, yeah, I just think the... You know, our goal is always to just keep it, keep things moving forward in some way. Like, if that's expanding your touring to, if you can get another crew member, if you can move to be able to carry more lighting and production, whatever it is, we always just want to, like, even if it's just incrementally, step it up a little bit every time around. And at some point, that was getting out of the van. Sure, sure. The opposite of what Henry Rollins advised you to do. Get out of the van. Um, you guys are very lean, healthy, and, and seem to be in, in pretty good shape. Is there any way to get exercise in when you're doing 40 dates in a, in a short stretch? Well, I mean, I, I feel like the shows are, you know, we play, I guess, when we're on tour, usually like two sets, so it's like three hours of playing a night, and... Just, just that alone is, is a workout. Um, I like to exercise. Um, I had high ambitions on this this tour. So the first uh, four weeks, I, I had my, like, resistance bands and stuff, and I was doing it three four times a week. And then, uh, then it just got too much for me, and, like, I just kind of had to save my energy for the shows and stuff. But um, I gave it my best. There you go. There you go. You tried, and, and I imagine there is no way, there is no app on your iPhone that can count the caloric loss and, and energy spent when you're on stage. There's no app built for that yet. Yeah, get on that. <laughs> yeah. That'll I'll be a that. non-moneymaker. It's all, <laughs> it's all you. I'll take that idea. I'll run with that. Um, do you have to, on the bus, when you're on these long stretches, really get that personal space and figure out how to get time for yourself? Or... After all these years of being with these guys who are your best friends in the world, it, do you not get on each other's nerves? Is it is it there's no boundaries anymore? Yeah, that's a pipe dream. Every <laughs> every band is sick of everyone else in their band and all their crew members, but I I think you just take whatever you know, whatever time you get. Like you get to the town and everyone goes and does their thing and um, you know, I I think that it that's how it works for every band at almost at any level, you know, you do have to spend a lot of time together and you're always waiting on the slow guy or, you know, everybody. Who, who's the slow cool. guy in Lotus? Uh, that would be Remble. <laughs> <laughs> Opposite of his guitar playing. That's how that works, I suppose. Um, you obviously got as tight and cohesive as you are through those long days in the van when you were first starting, and that's what really fuse the Lotus sound. Are, are you noticing now that even in this last tour, there was a particular song that from the beginning of the tour to the end of it, suddenly it's tighter, it's crisper, or you're able to expand more on it? Um, I can't think of a specific song, but what I do notice is like the, when we're improvising, the kind of like, the um, everyone gets on the kind of the same page and like, you kind of just get this feeling that Oh, there's going to be a big breakdown right here, and uh, when that's all clicking and it just seems like it's moving really fast, um, that's kind of what I notice on tour. Do you see that in a span of two, three shows, or is it really over the course of the tour? That's when the jams, you know, really get to explode. Um, you know, I I think it kind of ebbs and flows on tours. Like, if you're just certain shows can wear you down more than others. Like, if if it feels like it's not working or or the weather was really terrible or something sometimes that can take an effect on the whole group and sometimes like we start into a tour coming off of a bunch of rehearsals so even that like provides a sort of initial um jolt of energy that can translate into some cool stuff so yeah it's just 
it's kind of a matter of almost this definitely like physicality. Like when you're on tour and playing like five, six nights a week and you know, between sound checks and playing long shows, you just get like you're always always playing. Like I don't do that when we're off tour. So I think that's part of it that helps you just get like locked into that physicality of what it takes to um, play. So so really Lotus has a different personality if it's 20 degrees and sleeting outside or when you go into a city like Atlanta and it's 90 out and humid, there really is a, a, a palpable difference in the way you guys are, are playing? I, I think so. What's what's the good show, the heater or the, or the one where it's frigid out and you're trying to warm yourselves up? Um, you know, I think like, ultimately it's the crowd that really, really makes it like, you know, I, this last tour we ended after, you know, s seven weeks or something. We were all felt pretty exhausted, and it was a Sunday night, which sometimes can be slow. Um, but we played a show in Cleveland, and the crowd was just so into it. And that just, like, that hyped us up, you know. I Even even though we were all like, okay, this is the last thing. In some ways, we are thinking, let's just get it over with. But the crowd was just giving us so much back. It just it really felt good. Is there a way to approach that? You know that you're going to be dragging week five, week six. Do you, you know, huddle up before a show and say, like, we're in the thick of it, you know, we need to bring it? Or is it second nature at this point that you're pushing through, you know, that, that exhaustion? I would, I would just have our tour manager slap me across the <laughs> face, but then when it got Not pretty bad, it was like two or three. I'm sure. I'm sure that the fans didn't notice. I'm. I'm sure if you had a couple of welts on your face, they were thinking he's just grinning. Um, when when you are deep into a tour like that, do you have to plant surprises in a set list to really keep you guys clicking and interested, and make sure that you're interested in Lotus music? I mean, I imagine you know a lot of the new album is making its way into your into your tour sets, but but do you? throw things in that are either like a classic that we can all get locked in on or, you know, you throw a new one in there to keep everyone on their toes. How does the set list plan and go when you're deep in the tour? Yeah, I mean, for for us, we like to play a lot of different songs. So um, I think we would uh, get bored if it was the same um, 15 songs every night. So I think we played, uh, I don't think we quite hit 100, but we were like 97 songs that we played through the course of the tour. Um, so usually I'll start out with something I know, at least for the first one or two songs, that it's like, okay, I know we're going to nail this. Like, um, And then if it's something that's a little little more rare that we haven't played too much, and um, you know, I'll maybe put that in the middle of the set. But then sometimes those are the gems where it's like, oh, this is... I haven't played this for three weeks, and, like, you can really kind of feel it in a different way. And then, um, yeah, I think we appreciate that variety as much as the fans seem to appreciate that variety. Sure. I, I, obviously, you know, with rehearsals going into tour, you're trying to cycle through everything that you might play. But, you know, over the, the long stretches in a bus, will a cover pop up, or will you try a new original and try and break that out on the road, or, or do you like to, you know, really craft it at home before you take it out to the stage? Um, we definitely, we work on stuff all the time in sound checks, um, but a lot of times we like to, you know, w when you're initially putting something together, you know, we do a lot of work before we get the band together just to try to get the arrangements down, but still you end up tweaking some things and even when we're on the road sometimes we'll say like okay that 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 felt like it was going a little too long let's like cut this back a little bit and you you make adjustments so for us like the sound check is definitely as much making sure the sound is dialed in and then having some time to um, review things or or just make adjustments have have you um have you discovered anything from the crew that like really set you off or, or inspired you or is it you know is it generally stuff that you're pretty familiar with um i think we have like i have fairly similar musical interests as as uh, some of our crew members so yeah definitely definitely get some things from them are, are there new artists and, and maybe even some who are performing at electric forests who have you know definitely pushed some some boundaries for you and and you know challenge you to to maybe move in a new direction well, definitely not a new artist, but um, and someone I wish I could have caught. But on Thursday, Fortet played, and he was one of our um, 
big influences sure. kind of early on um, with that. I guess they called it Folktronica back then. I guess they probably don't call that that anymore. There's but, probably uh, some multiple syllable name that they're calling Quartet now. <laughs> but yeah, back before there was, I don't know, something, there was Fortet in the UK doing the Folktronica thing. Um, I, I feel like I've been listening to a lot a lot of uh, rock stuff lately. Um, just was able to catch Unknown Mortal Orchestra about a week and a half ago, and Excellent. that was great. And his new album is fantastic. Um, another one that I've been into recently is uh, Parquet Courts. And sure. They have this really great kind of. It reminds me of Television or Modern Lovers. That kind it's of like really strip. Vibe. Yeah, like real classic, kind of American, uh, like kraut influenced rock sound. For something like Electric Forest that is so heavily dance music, do you come into, you know, your set and say, we got to go, you know, four on the floor, or do you try and push the pendulum the other way and say, we're going to do a really rocking set? What's that conversation like? Um, we, we've gone both ways. Um as far as, oh, this is more electronic festival, we'll play more electronic, or this is a more electronic festival, we'll be the rock group. I think for Electric Forest, we just do what we do. Um, don't try to change the formula. You know, this is our, I mean, if you include, we played both Rothbury's, and this is our third time at Electric Forest, so. Um, You've established your sound. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's a reason we keep getting asked back, so just, just don't overthink it. And, and it helps to have Pan Astral on the lineup, I imagine, because then you can always have that David Byrne influence if you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's fun to do. That's nice to do. Do you, um, do you try to honor Talking Heads as much as you, you've done it in the past and done full tribute sets? Are you trying to, to bring that out into your, uh, your tour, or is that really for the special occasions? Um, we were doing it a little bit on tour. Actually, Pan Astral opened up for us. Um, for uh, the West Coast portion, so sure. we were doing a song a night with Gabe, and we've also been doing um, Once in a Lifetime with a sampled version of the vocals. But yeah, if, with Talking Heads, the the vocals are so key. We uh, we've never tried to turn one into a purely instrumental. Sure, sure. Um, does Gabe stay in character as David Byrne off stage? That's not a character. It's not even a character on stage. That's just Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, everyone was telling Gabe like how much his his dance moves resembled David Byrne, and we're like, oh yeah, that that's like this this one that song in um, in Stop Making Sense. He's like, oh really? I never I've never seen Stop Making Sense. What? <laughs> yeah. So that's just Gabe. <laughs> he nailed it. It's in his blood. That's excellent. So uh, you played last night. What's what's on the schedule for the rest of the weekend? Do you get to hang out? Yeah, we're just uh, chilling and uh, giving awkward hugs to fans. <laughs> Excellent.